Good evening, everyone. My name is Carl Brown, and I'm a commercial property partner at national law firm Clark Wilmot. Clark Wilmot is a member of the Bristol Law Society, and the Bristol Law Society is one of the partners for the Bristol Distinguished Address series. It's my very great honour to be able to introduce this evening I, Stephanie Boyce, and Stephanie is the 177th president of the Law Society of England and Wales, but is the first person of colour and the first black president in its history. Stephanie qualified as a solicitor in 2002 and has a great wealth of experience in corporate governance, regulatory frameworks and professional regulation. Stephanie holds a Master of Law in Public Law and Governance from King's College London and is a Fellow of the Chartered Governance Institute. In 2021, Stephanie was included on the Power List 100 Most Influential Black People in the UK. In 2020, I remember watching uh, a BBC Red Button clip featuring an inspiring young black female entrepreneur. And she was talking about how to raise aspirations for people from underrepresented backgrounds in her industry. And what she said was, you cannot be what you cannot see. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are very privileged to be able to see through Stephanie, a history maker. And so over to you, Stephanie. Well, thank you very much, Carl, for that instruction. And good evening, everyone. Um, and it is my absolute pleasure to be with you all virtually this evening. And for those not familiar with the Law Society, we are the professional body representing some uh, 200,000 plus solicitors across England and Wales. And our purpose is to be the voice of solicitors to drive excellence in the profession and to protect and safeguard the rule of law. So one of my favorite aspects of being president is being able to meet and speak with students. I hope that by sharing my story, my journey, I can encourage many of you to consider a legal career. And perhaps I'm a little biased, but in my view, being a solicitor is one of the most rewarding careers there, are, there is. So I may well find that in years to come, I will be able to greet many of you listening today as colleagues. Today or this evening, I will speak to you about my own journey into the law, the barriers I faced and what I'm doing as president of the Law Society to break down obstacles or to move those obstacles out the way for those who will come after me. So I took up my role as an office holder of the Law Society of England Wales in July 2019 and became the president last year in March. I am, as Carl said, the first person of colour to become president of the Law Society in its almost 200 year history. And I stand as living testament to the diversity, the growing dynamism, dynamism and social opportunity there is in the legal profession. It had always been my dream to enter the legal profession. And I grew up surrounded by injustices. I saw people across the globe struggling to exercise or enforce their rights. In 1985, my family relocated to the United States of America. And even though I lived there for the next six years, I always knew in my heart of hearts, I would return to the United Kingdom to study law. So in 1991, a few days or so after finishing high school, I returned to the UK and so began my legal career. But I stumbled upon my first barrier um, and that was discovering that my US qualification would not be recognized at that time in the UK. However, thanks to the access to high qualification route, I was able to enter London Guildhall University in 1996, from which I graduated with an LLB honors in politics. After that, I progressed to the legal practice course at the College of Law in Guildford. But again, securing a training contract was not an easy task. However, thanks to the steadfast encouragement of my father, I secured a placement with a local firm, Hord and James in Ellsbury. And I qualified in 2002 and uh, joined uh, my first in-house team a few years later. 
In 2010, I completed a master's degree in public law and global governance uh, at King's College, University of London, which Carl has already mentioned. Later in my career in private practice, um, and my reason for going in-house was because I had been made redundant twice in as many years um, and decided to move in-house. And I was told by my first recruitment agent uh, that I was not being realistic for wanting to move into the city, the city of London. But I uh, uh, decided that I knew better um, and I got rid of that uh, uh, consultant, that recruitment advisor. Um, and before I knew it, I became legal advisor to the then uh, complaints uh, commissioner of the Bar Council. And since that time, uh, all of my career has been spent in-house, an increasingly common career choice for many solicitors. And my work has focused on corporate governance, regulatory frameworks, and professional regulation. And I always had a desire to represent the profession I had fought so hard to become a part of. And I threw myself into working with the Law Society. I joined the council as a representative of the Women Lawyers Division in 2013, before going on to chair the Conduct Committee and join the Law Society's board. Finally, I set my sights on the presidency, uh, and, but I was not initially successful. Um, but drawing on those experiences I had gained throughout my career, I resolved to keep trying and to keep trying I did. And on my fourth attempt, yes, you heard me, my fourth attempt, I was elected to become the uh, Deputy Vice President. Um, and once you're elected as Deputy Vice President, it is an automatic three year trajectory to become President as I did um, uh, last year. So I hope that my journey can help inspire others to push through the obstacles they come across. And I have made one of the priorities of my presidency doing all I can to remove barriers for others. And the presidency is a great honour, uh, but more importantly, it is a tool to achieve change, a platform to bring about progress in the profession. And while we have come some way in the pursuit of a diverse and more inclusive legal profession, there is a lot more to be done if we are to achieve what we are aiming for, and that is a legal profession that reflects the community, the society it is serving. And this is not just a moral necessity, just as our legal system's international reputation and the reputation of those that practice within it rest in part on ensuring universal access to justice within the United Kingdom. It also rests on ensuring that the legal profession is representative. And we cannot claim that our legal system is the best it can be when we know that many talented people from non-traditional backgrounds are unable to join or reach the heights of our profession. And there is no one button marked make lawyers diverse. It's a complex issue with many factors, but the first step is identifying the root causes and looking to counter them. And that is what we at the Law Society are trying to do regarding solicitors. So with the pandemic having exacerbated inequalities across the sector, Lawyers with disabilities, women, LGBT+, and Black, Asian, and minority ethnic lawyers need the support of their law society more than ever. And that is why I have spent my time as president in office, challenging harmful and reductive attitudes on panels, in speeches, and in articles, as well as through the resources that we, the Law Society, provide. Attitudes like the belief that flexible work in is somehow lesser than presenteeism, that build blind allocation is unnecessary, that this whole diversity thing will sort itself out and doesn't need real commitment and effort from everyone. And our profession has made good progress in recent years in increasing diversity and inclusion, and is far more reflective of society than it was a decade ago. 52% of practicing solicitors are female, while 17.5% are from a black, Asian or minority ethnic background, figures which reflect those amongst the wider population. However, there are still obstacles faced by different groups in the legal profession, 
and there are no broad brush solutions to these challenges. But the Law Society is working to understand the different experiences of members of our profession and the role we can all play in removing the barriers that still exist. And this is a challenge the Law Society takes seriously, and we are doing our bit to help encourage diversity and inclusion amongst our members. And I have long said that it is my mission to leave this profession more diverse and inclusive than the one I entered. But I am clear that it must be a shared ambition with each and every one of us playing our part. So among the initiatives we run to help achieve this is our Diversity Access Scheme. The Diversity Access Scheme, or DAS as it's sometimes known, is a scholarship that has been running annually at the Law Society for over 10 years. It aims to identify exceptional students who have a strong ambition to qualify as a solicitor, but who, without support, will almost certainly not be able to realise that ambition. The DAGS supports talented aspiring solicitors by providing scholarships to enable students to complete the legal practice course or the solicitor's qualifying examination, helping them to gain relevant work experience and put them, putting them in touch with solicitor mentors who can provide invaluable advice on shaping their career path. DAS targets talented, tenacious people from disadvantaged backgrounds who have had to overcome particular challenges to continue their legal education. And those challenges might relate to social or financial issues, to family or cultural circumstances, or to a disability that makes the goal of qualifying as a solicitor a particularly challenging one. And so far, the DAS has supported over 200 students to continue their legal education and start their legal careers. We also run a social mobility ambassador programme, which was launched in 2015, to promote diversity in the profession by putting a spotlight on solicitor role models, such as Carl Brown, who you heard from earlier, and Justin Ferrance, who founded GROW, a mentoring organisation that works to support lawyers from underrepresented backgrounds, raise awareness of intersectionality, and offers mentoring to aspiring lawyers. The programme showcases accomplished members of the profession who have overcome socio-economic challenges to pursue their legal education and succeed in their careers. The Society selects 10 new solicitor ambassadors ordinarily. This year we've managed to do select 15 on a biannual basis to share their experience of entering the profession, including the obstacles they face and how they overcome them. Reflecting on their career path, each ambassador provides practical tips and advice on pursuing a career in law, providing inspiration and valuable insight for students considering a legal career. And we want to continue to build a network of solicitor ambassadors who are passionate about social mobility. And we want to demonstrate that the profession welcomes those who work hard and are determined and committed, regardless of where you come from. Our ambassadors' experiences are told in print through our ambassador booklets and in film on our ambassador web pages. We have also created a way for our ambassadors to help aspiring solicitors on a one-to-one -one level through the Ask Ambassador email address. And if you are ever in Chancery Lane and have the opportunity to visit me in my office, you will see social ambassador uh, pictures on the walls of my office. And of course, the Law Society cannot ignore its own role as an employer. We must show that we uphold the principles that we are encouraging our members and law firms to embrace. So last year, we joined the 10,000 Black Interns Initiative. And this was founded to help broaden career opportunities for young Black people in the United Kingdom and address the underrepresentation of Black talent in many industries, including law. As part of the initiative, the Law Society will be offering five paid internships across a range of our teams, beginning in the summer. And this will help to begin a sustainable cycle of mentorship and sponsorship for the black community. And these will be among a total of 188 internships that are made available through the programme across the legal services sector. And I would encourage any aspiring black solicitors 
to look at the initiative and see if it might help them gain the work experience they need to launch their career in law. So I've sketched out my own journey into the profession and what I hope to achieve as president. Now, I would like to leave those of you listening with some advice that I hope will serve you as well as you begin a legal career. The legal profession has always been adaptable, capable of responding to changing circumstances and new challenges. We always find ways to innovate and ensure we continue to provide the highest quality services to our clients. And for those who set upon the path to become a lawyer, you'll be faced with unprecedented challenges unlike those faced by your predecessors in years to have gone by. Indeed, you have already faced significant challenges as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, such as having to study remotely. And the resilience you have shown already in adapting to these strange circumstances will serve you well in your future careers, and I hope you can draw some strength from this. Although the challenges are significant, you will play an important part in shaping what the profession and the provision of legal services will look like in the years to come. And the Law Society is here to support you at every stage of your career. And there are a number of skills and talents that will support you in your legal career. Academic excellence is important, but employers also look for many other personal skills and attributes. But there are also other abilities that will help you. Um, and this is less about qualifications and more around what are sometimes known as soft skills. Our clients rely on us to support them and will look to you to meet their needs, which can be varied. So being flexible and open to new ideas will help you to find innovative ways to achieve this. And this means being able to solve problems and collaborate with others. Professional responsibility, personal integrity, and an ethical approach are non-negotiable for solicitors. You will be expected to meet the highest of ethical and moral standards, and this will form the bedrock of your relationship with clients. We are custodians of the rule of law, and we can only do so effectively by embodying both the letter and the spirit of the law. Lastly, resilience will be steadfast, will be a steadfast ally for you all, helping you to manage and push past the pressure that can come your way as a lawyer. And this could, can all sound a little overwhelming, but as I said earlier, you have all overcome unprecedented difficulties during the pandemic to get to where you are today. And you may find that looking back over this time you have already demonstrated and use those skills that will equip you well for a legal career. Finally, a piece of advice that has served me well throughout my own career and which I hope will do the same for you all. I absolutely believe that every door is open if you push, you persevere until something happens. Believe in yourself and your abilities and do not let your setbacks be the end of your story, but an opportunity to try again. So it has been a pleasure addressing you all this evening, and I would be happy, Wi-Fi permitting, to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you for sharing your inspirational story and your words of wisdom that I know that we, we all value. So we've got um, we've got quite a few questions for you coming through. So just a reminder that if you can post your questions for Stephanie in the Q and A chat, um, you can also boost your the questions that uh, we'll ask Stephanie by liking the questions. So we'll go with the questions that are the most popular. Um, so lots of comments being made, Stephanie, just saying, just glad that they're able to join you today. Um, lovely message about Kira as well, which I know you'll, you'll also appreciate, um, Kira, um, saying how proud we are of, of Kira as our, as our graduate and what an amazing business and young, young entrepreneur. But let's now get some questions for you, Stephanie. So first question, um, what were your greatest challenges to progression and what helped you the most? Greatest challenges? 
probably the greatest challenges to progression, I think, was that obviously, as I've grown, as I've got older, um, has been confidence. Um, in as much that, you know, I didn't apply to certain universities, I didn't apply to certain firms because I didn't think I was good enough, didn't think I would get in. Um, and of course, I, you know, uh, I now know, um, I know, I now have the confidence to know that actually, you've got to be in it to win it. You know, um, you know, if you don't, if you don't try, um, you know, if you try, and you don't succeed at first, then you keep trying. Um, you know, as I said earlier, you know, it took me four attempts to become uh, uh, Deputy Vice President to sit here as, to address you today, this evening, as President. Um, and if I had listened uh, to some of the advice uh, that I had been given along the way, I wouldn't be sat here. So confidence, determination and resilience ha have has developed as I have grown. Um, but I think at times it's been that self-doubt. Um, not being good enough, um, not being qualified enough, not being able enough. Um, so those have been, and, and of course, you know, others who told me because of my low socioeconomic position, you know, uh, that I didn't look like a solicitor, sound like a solicitor, a notion of what a solicitor should, you know, should sound like, look like. Um, and it's about, as I said before, it's about breaking down barriers, that actually there is no one type that a solicitor looks like. You know, we are diverse. We come in all different colours, sizes, shapes. Um, you know, we're found everywhere. Brilliant. Thank you. So you mentioned that 52% of solicitors are women. So what proportion of law firm partners are women? So from the data, uh, the recent data that we have, which is a couple of years old uh, uh, now because of the pandemic, um, but certainly I believe the data taken from 2018, 2019, 31% of uh, partners in private practice um, were female, are female. Um, and, and, and what we do know, of course, is that, you know, whilst we've seen that increase in females coming into the profession, so at entry level, where just under 64% of those entering the profession are female. But those numbers, as we know, are not translating into senior positions in uh, the solicitor profession. Um, and it's, it's, it's a growing concern. And of course, when you build an intersectionality into that, uh, those numbers are even starker. So for instance, uh, we know that in uh, the largest firms of uh, 50 or more partners, only 8% of partners are from a black Asian minority ethnic background. And that figure has only changed by 1% since 2014. Um, next question, it was, saying, uh, it was inspiring listening to you, Stephanie. Where can students find the 88 internships that you mentioned? Say that again, where can students find the... Uh, 88 is right. Oh, yeah, 88. 188. So there's reference to 88, but um, where can they find the internships that you mentioned? I know you mentioned a few through Grow and through DAS. Yes, yeah, so so Grow is uh, a capital, all capital letters, G-R-O-W. Um, and also, um, uh, our, yes, that's a good point. Our diversity access scheme is, which will pay for, um, as I say, the legal practice course or, or what was, um, the solicitor's qualifying examination. Um, so it'll pay the whole of those fees, plus provide you with work experience, plus provide you uh, with mentoring. Applications are now open, um, so uh, please do take a look on the Law Society's website, lawsociety.org.uk. Um, so that will tell you more about the DAS scheme. Um, and uh, 10,000 uh, Black Internship Scheme, which is the one that I was talking about, about the five paid um, internships that the Law Society is doing and others who are doing, um, the 188 internships, um, is found on, I believe it's the 10,000 uh, Black Internship, but I'll just double check that whilst I'm speaking to you. But I'm sure it's uh, 10,000 Black interns uh, that they have a website themselves. Yep, 10,000blackinterns.com. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, next question. Having achieved so much already, where do you see yourself in the next five to ten years? What other goals do you wish to accomplish? 
going back to what Carl said earlier when he was introducing me, you know, he spoke about, um, and um, sorry, Carl, but the name uh, escapes me. Um, but, you know, if you can't see it, you can't be it. It has been an absolute uh, pleasure to be here on this platform uh, and to use this platform to affect change, to be visible. So I would like to continue to advocate um, around, you know, access to justice, because for me, legal rights mean absolutely nothing. If you don't know when those rights are being taken away, or indeed you don't even know how to exercise those rights. And we have seen through successive governments, through underinvestment, through cuts, um, that individuals, ordinary citizens are struggling to um, access justice, you know, to find out what their rights are. Um, so I would like to continue to advocate for access to justice, to increase uh, the public's awareness around the law, um, to increase legal education in schools. I believe that law should be taught in schools and I will continue to campaign in that vein um, to get law added to uh, the national curriculum. Um, so where do I see myself in five to ten years still doing this work? Um, you know, um, globally, uh, uh, taking my uh, uh, the message globally and still doing great work around equality, diversity, inclusion and social mobility. Social mobility is an absolute passion of mine as I tell my story as first generation British coming uh, uh, from a, a single parent household, um, you know, growing up on a council estate. Um, and I say my parents, my grandparents come into this country in search of faith, hope and greater opportunities. And I hope that indeed, you know, I am fulfilling their hopes, their aspirations, but also inspiring others along the way. OK, next question. The phrase equality, diversity, inclusion is the buzzword at present in all industries. What does the phrase evoke in you, Stephanie? Well, I think Verna Myers summed it up uh, quite aptly when she said, um, you know, diversity is being invited to the party, but inclusion is being asked to dance. You cannot have diversity without having inclusion. Um, and I go back to the point that um, we all want the same things. You know, we all want equality of opportunity. You know, although some of us, um, uh, you know, are there, some of us um, uh, take it to another level in terms of how we're going to achieve that. But for the most part, we all want the same thing. And that is to be recognised for the skills and experience and capabilities that we all have. Um, and to be given the opportunity to showcase uh, uh, those skills, those, those, those capabilities, and to fulfil our own ambitions to be the best that we truly believe that we are. Um, what can the Law Society and employers do to counter socioeconomic factors that prevent entry into the legal profession for underrepresented groups? So what we'll do it. So what we are doing is we know in the solicitor profession that 23% of us have been privately educated, as opposed to 7% of the wider UK population. So there is an overrepresentation in the solicitor profession of those of us who have been privately educated. When I say us, I do not include myself. Um, to make that clear, so one of the things when people say to me, "Why do you tell your story?" It is absolutely important that we that I tell my story, that we tell our stories. So there is an awareness um, there of how uh, uh, you know uh, the, our background, our backstory, and through telling our story, through telling my story, you know that has um, encouraged others to tell their story. Um, mm. And we're now hearing stories of, of senior partners of major firms, you know, who are coming out and saying, "Well, actually." I grew up on a council estate. Actually, I was in re receipt of free school dinners, um, you know, and so forth. First generation uh, uh, to go to university and so forth. Um, and also, so the Law Society is doing great work around social mobility and raising the profile of it. I spoke briefly about our social mobility program, spoke about our DAS program. But we also uh, are part of the Government Commission Socio Mobility Task Force, which has been commissioned to look at socio-economic diversity in the financial services and the professions. Um, and through that work and working closely with the Social Mobility Commission, we are 
uh, raising awareness um, and asking colleagues to take a look at not only where you recruit, but how you recruit in terms of contextualized recruitment. Um, and there are a number of bodies out there that we know that businesses, firms are working with to ensure that they are uh, 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 reflecting best recruitment practice. Think about places and the language that we use um, and it, to ensure that we are really recruiting, you know, um, uh, 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 from diverse backgrounds and that people are not prevented, not uh, uh, stopped from joining our profession because we cannot claim to be the best legal profession in the world when we know that people from non-traditional backgrounds are not able to progress in our profession. So as I said, we've done lots of work and we'll continue to do lots of work, but the work continues. Um, uh, we still have people who are disadvantaged, who are not uh, uh, reaching the heights of our profession. Um, so we're very diverse at, at entry level across all the characteristics, including uh, uh, from a, a socioeconomic, a low socioeconomic position, but that does not translate into the senior parts of uh, the profession. Thank you. Um, building on that, another question, how does the Law Society plan to contribute to the developing agenda for improving access to justice for neurodivergent individuals? Well, absolutely. And in fact, I think in about two weeks time, I'm speaking uh, on that very topic. So, um, so we have a work plan around neurodiversity, um, a work plan around neurodiversity, and we're seeking to educate uh, our members and indeed ourselves as to what that means um, and how and what guidance we can put out to ensure that employers are uh, understand neurodiversity um, uh, um, and how they can better uh, empower uh, their own employees. Um, a to 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 to, to come forward and, and, and um, uh, openly say uh, what um, what they feel are some of the barriers around uh, perhaps their progression in the profession. Um, and that just to be alert to that there are different ways of thinking, different ways of doing things, um, and to be alert um, and ensure that actually that nobody is disadvantaged um, because of their, uh, their differences, but those differences should be celebrated, embraced. And so we're doing lots of work um, and, have, and have added that our lawyers with uh, disabilities division um, is doing lots of work around neurodiversity um, in ensuring that it's that the profile, the conversation around it is raised um, and the, the awareness around it is raised, as I said, and people are talking and discussing it and employees are aware of and putting in uh, uh, effective tools to ensure um, that those differences are celebrated and embraced. Um, next question. If you experience imposter syndrome when faced with a room of men in a professional situation, how do you overcome those insecurities to achieve your goals? Is this, is this a hypothetical question? Sorry, did you say it again? If? If you experience imposter syndrome when faced with a room of men in a professional situation, how do you overcome those insecurities to achieve your goals? Um, it's a good question. I can't say that I have um, experienced imposter syndrome with a, uh, a room full of men. Um, you know, I st there are many occasions where, you know, as a black woman, I am the only black person in the room. Sometimes, quite rightly, at times, I can be the only female in the room. Um, you know, for me, if you ask me the question, do I ever experience imposter syndrome? And I think, you know, when I recently was interviewed by Channel 4, I was asked that question. Um, and, uh, and in fact, in, in, in front of me on my screen at the moment was the example I gave when I shared the stage with Hillary Clinton. That was one of the times where, you know, uh, I did um, for a brief moment have imposter syndrome when I thought, oh, my goodness, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, and I had, you know, my script in front of me and I thought, you know what, Stephanie, you've got this. You have absolutely got this. And this goes back to the point that, you know, you, I don't have to be apologetic, you know, nor am I apologetic for being in the space that I am because I've worked hard to get here. Um, and, you know, I'm just as qualified, just as able, capable and so forth. Um, and that's what we need to remind ourselves, continue to remind ourselves that, you know, we are, we have earned the right to be where we are. 
um, uh, and we don't need to justify ourselves. Um, so, and that could be born about because of my determination, because of my resilience. Um, what you do get, of course, is that, you know, um, and I had this very earlier in, in my career when I went to work for a non-departmental uh, government body. Um, and I walked into that room and it was a boardroom filled of lawyers. And I walked to him. And the first question that, you know, people were asking was, um, so, uh, you know, what firm were you with? Um, because this room was filled with ex uh, uh, city uh, lawyers who, um, uh, and I don't think that they had come across an in house uh, solicitor before. Um, and, and, you know, and when I first went in house, I don't think that is still the case, but when I first went in house, there was this notion, this idea that you couldn't hack private practice, you know, um, and that's why you'd gone in house. Um, the interesting thing, of course, is that in-house is the fastest growing area of our profession at the moment. Some 25% uh, of our members go in in-house. Um, and what's even more interesting is from the data that we do have, we know that if you happen to be female, if you happen to be from black, Asian, minority, ethnic background, you are more likely to go in-house than indeed as I did. Um, and for a variety of reasons, notably uh, flexibility, career progression um, uh, and so forth. Um, but it, it, imposter syndrome, um, I'm sure there are times where, you know, it, it, it comes, it visit, you know, it visits upon me. Um, but I don't, I, I don't have time to, to take it on board, you know, uh, because I absolutely believe, as I say, and I tell myself through my positive as affirmations daily, you know, I am qualified, I am able, capable to be here. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and this is, a, a, you know, especially at the moment, this is a high pressured role. People are ready and willing, um, you know, uh, to, 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 to pounce on anything you say. And I don't read comments um, because um, for, for a number of reasons, this is why I don't read comments. Staff will read those comments. Um, and if they need to act upon comments that are in the, in the public domain, then they certainly will. Um, and I'm grateful to them that they don't pass those comments on to me. Um, but, you know, um, but yeah, I think it's important that you hold your own, you find your own, you, you find your own way and you're strong and confident um, in where you're at. Okay, um, next question. With respect to firsts need not be onlys, what is the best way to continue your legacy in terms of diversity within the profession? the best way we can continue this is that, you know, um, as I've always said, you know, how amazing would it be when we're no longer talking about, you know, uh, uh, diversity, because we're so diverse, we're so, you know, um, inclusive, we're, we're, you know, socioeconomic background is, is no longer um, a barrier to progression, to entry and so forth. So we continue to discuss, we continue to talk, we continue to advocate, but most importantly, we see action, real targeted, committed action that moves the dial. And absolutely, I might be the first person of colour president in almost 200 years uh, to become president of the Law Society of England and Wales. And indeed, the deputy vice president coming up, uh, not the deputy vice president, the vice president coming up behind me, uh, Lubna Shuja. Um, is also from an ethnic minority background. Um, but it's important, as I say, that each of us has the ability to affect change. Um, each of us has the ability to move the conversation on, to be part of the change that we all want to see. Um, and our profession can only be richer for those changes, for the desire to ensure that those coming up behind us um, you know, have greater opportunities and can progress um, and reach the top. You mentioned having the courage to persevere against the odds. How do you overcome those feelings of not being good enough or not worthy? Well, as I say, I, I yeah. every single day and throughout the day, tell myself um, lots of positive affirmations. Um, as I say, I don't listen. Uh, uh, I don't read commentary, um, you know, uh, because quite frankly, you know, rightly or wrongly, what other people think of me is, is completely none of my business. Words have power. They, uh, you know, they seep into you, if you, they can seep into your very core 
um, and take roots. And like a, a, a movie, they continue to play and play and play on your mind. Um, so, you know, I'm all about positivity, all about positive thinking. And I know at times that can be very difficult. It can be very hard for any one of us. But I absolutely um, tell myself, as I say, that I am just as qualified, committed, able. I have earned my right to be in this space. Um, and I work hard to ensure the visibility around this, uh, around this role, to ensure that I am uh, a role model as I say, for those coming up behind, because we absolutely, I absolutely must lift as I climb to ensure, as I say, that others have the opportunity, that we continue with those conversations. We continue to shine a spotlight on the inequalities that exist within our society. Um, and to ensure that, as I say, you know, aptitude, ability, skills, those are the determinant factors, nothing else. How will the Law Society deal with the challenges posed by hybrid working, especially for new entrants to the profession? So the Law Society has issued guidance. We issued guidance very early on during the height of the pandemic. Um, we continue to update that guidance in terms of discussions with our members and so forth. Um, we're not prescriptive because, um, you know, it's guidance. Um, and a number of uh, businesses, firms have taken different approaches. Some have said that colleagues need to be in the office, you know, all the time. Um, some have said, you know, two, three days working in the office with the remainder working from home. Each business, each organization's firms will take their own approach dependent on their business needs, their clients' needs, um, and so forth. But as I said, we have issued guidance and have updated that guidance um, to ensure um, that colleagues are, um, uh, are, are equipped with the right tools necessary to make the right judgment for their business. Um, in respect of younger colleagues, we know, we understand that um, there is a concern around younger colleagues. Um, but, you, you know, in terms of uh, um, the hybrid working, that actually younger colleagues might need to, they need to be potentially in the office to ensure that they are being uh, trained, uh, supervised, that they can ask those questions, have those discussions. Um, and so we ask businesses to reflect on that position as well, uh, rather than as some businesses have completely moved to remote working. But, um, but as I say, we're not prescriptive. We offer guidance only. But can I say, not just from a young perspective, but also, um, you know, uh, throughout every stage of your career, and even if I think about my own uh, experience, um, I prefer face-to-face. -face, um, I prefer to be face-to-face. -face, but then, you know, there are benefits from hybrid working. Um, you know, this evening presents an absolute opportunity for us to engage virtually um, because, you know, potentially we wouldn't have been able to reach this many uh, individuals if we had been in person. But I do think there is something about uh, being in a room full of people, um, uh, you know, pandemic aside, but being in a room full of people um, you know the body language the the atmosphere the conversations i know that um one of the, the the difficulties when we first went into uh lockdown was that i went from being in a room filled with people where people were taking pictures asking questions and so forth to being in front of a screen um and then i'd still be sat there at the end of it um and then i would see the host has ended uh uh you know the event or whatever it was um, and just be sat there going, oh, okay. So um, I, as I say, prefer to be in the office, but I know that every uh, organization business will do things um, that meets their business needs um, and will listen and have that conversation with their employees in turn. Um, question then about um, GCSE level pupils. Is there a scheme in place or a foot for GCSE level pupils looking to gain short snippets of work experience? I don't know. I can't answer that question. I don't know. Um, it is potentially, um, potentially we could find out. Um, so uh, if, if I can, I'll come back to, I'll come back to you on that. 
Okay, I think I think that's the. I mean, you've got lots of um, compliments in terms of inspiring, incredibly inspiring talk, giving you a stand innovation from my living room. That came from John. So Thank just you. double checking now. There's no further questions that anybody wants to post on the chat. No, I think I think we're done, Stephanie. So. Thank you ever so much for sharing all of your inspirational stories, your experience, your advice, and so candidly and honestly um, and passionately answering all of the questions that the audience has put to you. Um, so thank you for joining us this evening.